Hello there, my name is Erica Hargaden. I'm a certified child sleep consultant with my private practice, Babogue, and I'm here to present to you today a child sleep um, webinar to help you guys understand maybe how to establish healthy sleep habits with your children and, and really understand what they are and, and how to get them. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank uh, Wexford uh, County Library and County Council for the opportunity to present you guys. It's great that the Parenting Today programme is going ahead with the circumstances that we're now living in. So here we go. This is me. Erica Hargaden, as I said, certified child sleep consultant with my private practice, Babog. I'm the creator of the Sleep Series, which is an online sleep program, all video based, that is based around my seven steps to better sleep, which I'm actually going to run through with you guys in this uh, presentation. I'm a mum of three, and it was my journey with my first child's poor sleep that brought me to where I am now. I love sleep. To say that I love sleep is an understatement, but I actually didn't understand or know how much I loved it and how much I really needed it until I was dealing with sleep issues with my first child. Um, he was seven months old when I really took quite a chronic situation and turned it around. Um, the sleep deprivation was having a very negative effect on my family very negative effect on me, very negative effect on my husband, on my relationship with him, in my family, my friends. Like I could really go into an awful lot of detail around this story. But really, once I started to understand his sleep and put the things that I had kind of sought out and really kind of educated myself on, I turned my life around. Now, he is 11 now just turned 11 so when I went on to have two more children I really didn't want what I experienced with him to happen to me again so I read everything like absolutely everything I could about sleep I really self-educated myself about it at that time and I took that knowledge and that experience that I had with him and I brought it to the table with my next two children and I really was able to mold and shape their sleep from birth my daughter my middle child slept through the night at seven weeks and my son my youngest who's now four he slept through the night at about 12 um, 12 weeks um, not easy you know kind of a lot of shaping but a lot of flexible routines that I put in place and that's something maybe I want to try and impart on you guys um, here today so why is sleep so important I think sleep has been a grossly underestimated pillar of health over the last number of decades we've actually been conditioned to believe that we can survive with very very little sleep and that it's okay but we actually can't it, food, shelter and water and sleep go together and really sleep is at the beginning of it. If we're not sleeping well, the rest tends to not fall into place. So it really is a cornerstone for our health and our well-being and um, it protects our physical and our mental health. It really produces a better quality of life for ourselves. Like if you're a sleep deprived parent and you're watching this, you're probably know that you have felt better. So maybe when you were sleeping well, so do the comparison. And sleep actually safeguards our personal safety. There is a wonderful book out um, there by a neurologist called Matthew Walker. He's very renowned and it's called Why We Sleep. And that book goes into a lot of detail, but very um, digestible detail on clinical trials that have been done around sleep. And one of them always sat like really, like just jumped out of the page at me. That if you are like dealing with four hours sleep a night on a regular basis, when you're behind the wheel of a car, you may have the same reaction times as somebody who is over the drink driving limit. And that really was like, oh my God. So. Basically, if you're not sleeping well, you are not performing at your maximum capacity and your body is not able to process at its maximum capacity. 
So while we sleep, our bodies rest and restore and conserve energy. Basically, we, we get ready for the next day's activities. But there's extremely important body process that only happen during sleep. You know, and there's certain hormones for those body processes that are only released during sleep. And this is adults and children. But our blood pressure decreases, our heart rate goes down, our breathing gets much more tempoed and our body temperature actually drops. You know, during this time frame, our memories are embedded. So things that we've learned and gone through during the day all go in and our daytime functioning is restored. So why and how would you know if maybe you have a sleep issue with your child and, you know, who gets them? Anyone, absolutely anyone. I am sure there is people from all walks of life, all sorts of different backgrounds going to watch this and anybody can be affected by it. But how do you know you have an issue versus, you know, maybe a normality or a blip? I would say if your child is over six months and you have been dealing with a particular issue around their sleep for about four to six weeks, then you potentially have a sleep issue. Now, potentially, and I'm hoping by going through this um, presentation, you will have a better understanding of maybe trying to figure that out yourself. But what constitutes a sleep issue? So like no consolidated stretches of sleep at night, so constant broken sleep, like frequent night waking, uh, resistance to sleep. So like you find it extremely difficult to get your baby to go to sleep for nights and for, you know, naps. Awake for long periods of time overnight. So let's say they wake and like it takes a further two hours to get them to go back to sleep. Uh, early morning waking. So six o'clock is not an early morning wake. 5 a.m. If your baby is looking to try and start their day like before 5 a.m. or around 5 a.m., then you potentially have a sleep issue going on there and no consistent napping. So where like napping is just all over the place. And if the situation feels fraught, remember everybody's sleep goals and everybody's family sleep goals are completely different. So like what's happening with your neighbor uh, you know what's happening with you or maybe the same thing but one is feeling okay with the situation and then that potentially isn't a sleep issue you know it, it all depends on on what your kind of measurement is but I remember when I was dealing with my son's sleep it felt fraught we were not okay the wheels were coming off the bus massively so that's something that I always like to say to parents if it feels fraught to you but why do these sleep issues happen? Now, these are the key points. So biological timekeeping. So where your baby maybe is napping during the day, but not necessarily napping at time frames that are suitable for them biologically. So they might be actually not getting restorative sleep and they might actually be having junk sleep instead. Or there's a nap imbalance going on. Like for example, where I would see maybe nine month olds who are having a very long nap in the morning and a very short nap in the afternoon and they're early morning waking then, that's a nap imbalance. So trying to balance those things out will really, really help. Potentially a parental dependency. So like you're rocking, rolling, patting, feeding, co-sleeping. Co-sleeping is not an issue unless you feel it's an issue, but it can potentially become a thing that your child like needs so let's say for example you have a toddler and you have to lie down with them for them to go to sleep at night and then they're waking constantly overnight then it could be that they're parental dependent so they're seeking you out again overtiredness is chronic for sleep so if you have a child that's not napping very well and you're stretching them out during the day and they're absolutely exhausted that can really create fragmented sleep at night and um, sleep associations they're very similar to some of the parental dependencies so maybe like feeding to sleep maybe there is um, a big dependency on the soother constant soother replugs also sleep environment if your sleep environment is not supportive of your child's sleep and that's something i'm going to bring you through in my seven steps to better sleep then you're not laying out the foundations that will really help your child sleep for example Everybody needs to sleep in a darkened environment because melatonin, the sleepy hormone that helps us initiate and maintain sleep, does its best work 
in darkness. If there is bright light or maybe like napping in a bright environment like, it, like this, you may not necessarily get the best, most restorative napping for your child. So these are my like baby sleep guidelines. You'll see like, please feel free to take a picture of this, no issue whatsoever. Based on the months, you know, kind of let's say the wake period between naps, approximate length of naps and the number of naps during the day, plus 11 to 12 hours approximately at night. This is a guide. Babies are not robots. They will not do exactly what the book, the book says they might do similar. So use all these things at a guide. But for example, I would get a lot of messages about the age range of three to six months and babies doing very short naps. Now I've put in there that you'd like to see naps of an hour and a half to two and a half hours, but an awful lot of babies in that age range because of daytime sleep and maturity are only able to do 45 minutes because their body hasn't matured enough to allow them to do any more. And that can come better between six and nine months. So kind of understanding all of these things will help you understand your baby and then help lead them on the path to as settled sleep as you wish them to have. This is what nap cycles look like. So you can see, I oh, spelled minutes wrong. You can see that we have like a 45 minute cycle. All right. So basically, that's why you might see your baby only sleep for 45 minutes, because that's a sleep cycle. And as they mature, they get the skill maybe to link up the cycles. And that's how you get maybe that lovely dream hour and a half to two hour sleep cycles out of babies. This is what a nighttime sleep cycle looks like. They generally go every two to four hours. So that's why I would always look when I'm working with families directly, you know, is baby waking every sleep cycle? And usually if they're coming to me, they generally are. So how do you achieve healthy sleep for your baby? I want to say from the outset, there's no lost causes. Um, I have worked with families as old as 12, um, on a joint capacity. And, you know, I generally would only work with families one-to-one -one from six months, but you can mold and shape sleep from earlier than that, but you have to understand their biological capabilities. Decide on your sleep goals. If you want to co-sleep, all well and good, off you go. Practice it safely, no problem. But if you're the type of family that wishes to have more independent sleep, that's what you want and that's what you set and that's what you lead with your child. Um, find the right kind of methodologies around sleep for you. Are you maybe more on the side of like gentle parenting? You know, what is it that ticks your box? What is it that you're going to find that sits well with you and helps you to be most consistent? Um, if you want to work on sleep, generally, you know, you can pave the way from the newborn stage, but usually I would find parents kind of around four to six months looking to start shaping sleep. Routine is key. And parents hate me saying this, but unfortunately it is key. As human beings, we are bodies thrive on routine and the same as for children they absolutely thrive on routine however our personalities may not like that but unfortunately if you want to achieve settled sleep with your child you may have to put a routine in place that potentially restricts you a little bit now team effort now i just want to say this doesn't mean to say that if you don't have a partner in your life that you're scuppered you're not Call in the help of your friends. Call in the help of your family. But if you have another half in your life, it's a team. Don't take it on all yourself. And I'm directing this at the mammies because the mammies tend to take it all on. And then, you know, you can't pour from an empty cup. You end up falling because, you know, you're exhausted and you're taking on everything and it's too much to take. Consistency is key. And this is something that I'll go into in the seven steps. If you're not being consistent around your child's sleep, then you're at nothing. You might as well throw sand at the walls. You won't get anywhere. If you're looking to work on sleep, then start with the nights because the sleep pressure will be higher and you will generally kind of get that little bit of success. And if you're working on sleep and maybe ironing out a sleep issue, give it time. Rome was not built in a day and you will not iron out a problem in a night. It could take a good few weeks, particularly with early morning waking. So you've got to give it the consistency and no disruptions. Now I know like we're all living in a different time now at the moment, but no family weddings, no moving house, no big holidays, 
you know, nothing like that. You need to do this at a time frame when there is very little happening so that you can really, really focus in. And your sleep environment is key. The sleep environment that's appropriate for your baby at their age range is key. So I'm going to run through here now what to expect out of kind of various stages, you know, of your babies, kind of maybe up to about the toddler stage. So newborn, kind of up to three or four months, it is sleep survival, lads. Your baby is not biologically mature enough to sleep. They may or may not sleep for long stretches of time. They may wake a lot. They may not. But at the end of the day, as parents, and particularly with this age range, it is feeding, sleeping, minding, like period. Really, you can sleep mold at this age range, but I would like parents always to err on the side of like feeding them and bond. Like bond is massive. You have to bond with your baby. And if you're overrun with like sleep, 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 it can cause a bit of the crazies and you need to kind of step away from it. If you're looking to try and create as settled sleep as possible, I would recommend that parents swaddle. Um, now, swaddling isn't practiced in an awful lot of uh, hospitals in Ireland because of heat in hospitals, but you can still swaddle responsibly when you come home. So I had my last child uh, nearly five years ago, he's four and a half now, um, and we weren't advised to swaddle in the hospital, and that was fine. I didn't swaddle in the hospital, but I did swaddle as soon as I came home. So just because you don't swaddle in the hospital doesn't mean you can't swaddle when you come home. Um, rock your baby, pat your baby, hold your baby, do whatever you can because really they need as much sleep as they possibly can get so that they don't get overtired. But I would recommend you practice a feed, play, sleep cycle. So you can see that I'm feeding after sleeps. Feed, play, sleep cycle. So if you think about it, your baby goes down for a sleep and when they get up, they're having a feed rather than feeding to sleep. And this can be practiced by breastfeeding parents as well. So basically you're trying to disassociate feeding from sleep and regularizing your daytime feeds once your supply is established. This is easier to do with bottle fed babies, but it is possible with breastfed babies. Now, four to six months, their sleep cycles are starting to mature, just about. You probably will see the nighttime cycles mature first and then the daytime sleep will come thereafter, but it takes slow. This is a key time to start establishing healthy sleep habits. Um, and I would be watching your baby's kind of wake periods and their sleepy cues. For example, a baby of four months can probably only stay awake about an hour and a half between sleeps, but a baby of six months can probably stay awake about two hours between sleeps. But remember, these are not targets. Your baby is not a robot. You've got to figure out what your baby's sweet spot is so that you're hitting their sleep waves. Frame their days. Start their day every day at seven o'clock with a feed in a room that's not associated with sleep. And this actually is a tip I use with newborns. So therefore you're anchoring the day and you're starting the day. Now listen, lads, if you've had a tough night, that's a hard thing to do, but it is a really good way of regularizing everything. And you can start really doing your established bedtime at this age range. You're gonna have a lot of trial and error and you're gonna have a lot of molding. But if you can try and take an 80-20 rule with it, where you're maybe 80% of the time working on sleep and 20% of the time just like taking a break and putting them in the buggy and going for a walk, you're doing a brilliant job. If you've got a lot of parental input going into sleep, start decreasing it slightly. So therefore, you're allowing baby to gain their own skills. You'd probably be looking at about three to four naps a day at this age range. Um, babies differ because if they're only sleeping 45 minutes, then they may need the four naps. You've got to gauge this one. Now, six to nine months, you're getting closer to even more like maturity in those sleep cycles, particularly at the nine month age range. There's another transition in wake periods in this age range. So you'd probably find that baby can stay awake maybe two, maybe two and a half hours between sleeps. And again, this would transition as your baby gets closer to nine months. You can really establish napping in this age range, like because the, the sleep cycles are getting even more mature. And at six months, you'd probably see a very, very anchored three naps a day. But by the time your baby gets to eight months, you would probably see them drop the third and last nap of the day and go to two naps a day. That's a big transition. 
feeding overnight if you're a breastfeeding parent i would absolutely expect to see feeding overnight within this age range however if you're a bottle feeding parent and your baby is getting established on solids there is the potential that your baby could go through the night without a feed from a dream feed so from like a tav 10 feed so this varies hugely amongst babies. But if you understand these kind of things, you can figure out what suits your child rather than firefighting it in the middle of the night. And also by anchoring and scheduling the daytime feeds, you're more likely to get them good and full during the day. So they're less likely to look for the feeds overnight. If you have kind of got issues going on, they can easily be broken at this stage and bring you into the settled sleep that we talk about. Um, nine to 14 months now i would consider this if you have got a baby who's quite settled on sleep that this can be quite a settled time with sleep because your baby's maybe napping as well established they are on two naps a day maybe up to this point they're probably staying awake about three hours between sleeps you maybe have a very regular bedtime the only things that can kind of throw into the mix here and these can happen at any stage is developmental milestones. So maybe your baby is starting to crawl, starting to cruise, close to the 14 months, maybe starting to walk. Also, separation anxiety can really like scupper sleep a little bit at this time frame. And what I'll say to you is the their blips, they are things that happen around your child's develop development. But then as the, you kind of deal with them and you're consistent around them, it'll be a point in time and it will pass. And if you can do that and practice that, not kind of create new habits, then you'll get out the other side of it. Now, at 14 months, between 14 and 16 months, you would be looking at your baby transitioning to one nap a day. Now, this again is not a target. This is different for every baby. So like, I had one child transition to one nap a day at 11 months and all my other children, it was kind of 14 to 16 months. I have a client um, recently messaged me to say that her 18 months was still on two naps a day. It varies, guys. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Now, I'm actually overlapping. So again, the, you will see here that it's a lot of kind of overlap. Developmental milestones can really impact. You've got that transition to one nap a day. You know, sometimes in this age range, if you're kind of not on top of sleep and, you know, kind of, let's say, have settled sleep with your baby, it can potentially get a little bit worse. So really trying to work on things prior around this stage would always be kind of my preference. But that doesn't mean to say if you get beyond this point, that it's the point of no return. It's not. It's not at all. 18 months and she's a cutie. Um, generally, you would see babies drop their napping um, somewhere between two and three years of age. This is always a question I get asked. And I think it's one of the questions um, in the Q&A with this. So basically, I would see the biological need for formal napping to drop around three years of age or potentially before. However, that doesn't mean to say that your child isn't tired. So, you know, you might find that your child starts to drop their napping at some point between two and three. And my, my top tip is use early bedtime if they're dropping napping and you know they're tired. My other top tip for this age range is to not transition your child into a big bed until they are three or over. The other thing you're going to be dealing with is toddler ego. No, mommy. No, mommy. I know, I know go bed, mommy. No, no. No, no is their favorite word. So really this is about establishing bedtime rules in your house and establishing what you expect around sleep and what your family sleep looks like and leading it and really, really leading it and, and maybe using some behavioral tactics to, to handle that. Now I'm gonna bring you through my seven steps to better sleep. And I really, really feel that these help parents so much when they are trying to figure out how to lay foundations and how to mold healthy sleep habits for their children. So number one is sleep environment. Firstly, it needs to be safe. And I could honestly spend an entire webinar talking about safe sleep. I'm extremely passionate about it. And if you want to learn more about safe sleep, I'd encourage you to go to my Instagram account at babog underscore sleep, and I have a video there on it. Safe sleep is just paramount. It's so important. Um, I would also ensure that your sleep environment for your baby is as dark as dark can be. Now, 
a lot of parents obviously would be like, no, like blackout blinds are expensive and blackout curtains are expensive. Of course they're, they're so expensive. But you know what, I've, you know, isn't expensive? Black bags from Aldi sell a taped to the windows. That can create the darkness that you need. What I'll say to you is don't leave the black bags up during the day because if you've got bright weather, it can crack the windows with the heat. I learned that the hard way in a holiday house. Um, so the darkness is key. So melatonin, I'm going to say this again, melatonin, the sleepy hormone, needs darkness for it to do its job for sleep initiation and sleep maintenance. I also would recommend that your baby sleep um, from kind of four months on is in a, in a quiet environment in your house. If you're expecting your baby to nap well in a busy kitchen, unfortunately, it's unrealistic. So like I would start establishing that consistent place of sleep around that age range. So if they're in like a co-sleeper or a bassinet or something like that, transition them to a cot not necessarily in their own room, but the cot being their consistent place of sleep. And then look at maybe if you're looking for independent sleep to put them into their own room from maybe six months onwards. Also look at the temperature. Somewhere between 20 and 21 degrees is just about right when it comes to baby sleep. But don't check extremities because extremities are always going to be cold. Like check, you know, the kind of chest and maybe back of the neck if you're trying to figure out and obviously use a monitor. Now, one thing I want to touch on here in terms of that darkness is blue light. There is so many products out there with blue light on them. I'm not gonna name them, but loads of products with blue light, loads of monitors, loads of like little toddler clocks with blue light on them. Blue light is the worst light that you can have in any room for sleep. And it is also what is emitted from our mobile phones and from our televisions. Blue light technology is extremely stimulating. Blue light from a bulb is stimulating to the brain and it can draw people, humans, children out of sleep. Don't use them. If you're in favor of using a night light, which I don't necessarily recommend um, in the baby stage, orange or like red maybe that kind of color uh, light is preferable the next of the seven steps is timings timings are absolutely key if you're not getting the timings right around your baby's age range and i ran through that in the different stages then you, you know, it's not going to fall into place. So trying to figure out the right timings around your baby's sleep is really quite important. So like, let's say a six month old is getting up at approximately seven o'clock in the morning. We'd like to see them having their first nap at approximately nine o'clock. And when they're awake from that nap, then their next nap would be approximately two hours later. But you've got to find out what suits your baby. And a consistent morning time and a consistent bedtime will really help you anchor that and figure that out. Now, milk solids balance. Now, I'm very much in favor of structured feeding, structured feeding in a balanced way. Now, for breastfeeding uh, parents, please don't be like, oh, I can't do that. You know, if your baby is feeding on demand, all well and good. But I think if you're trying to work on sleep, structuring feeding really helps because it helps you move away from maybe feeding to sleep associations. And I wouldn't recommend that you structure feeding with breastfeeding um, babies until maybe they're about eight or 10 weeks so that your feeding is well established and the bond is well established. You can obviously structure feeding more with bottle fed babies, but ultimately following a feed play sleep cycle is what is important. And that disassociation of feeding from sleep. I also wouldn't allow babies to sleep through feeds during the day. I would always make sure you wake your baby for feeds during the day because if they miss a feed during the day, they're missing a nutritional point and they will seek it somewhere else, probably at night. If you're introducing solids, you know, kind of from six months onwards, um, I would kind of try and do it slow enough. Um, a lot of the um, weaning experts now are recommending maybe the introduction of solids from five and a half months. Now, I'm not a weaning expert, but to kind of get them into the first taste so that by the time you get them to six months, then you're able to introduce protein. Now, I'm not a fan of the protein-based meal at tea time, at like five or six o'clock. Until a baby is nine or 10 months, until the digestive system has a real chance to mature, I prefer that protein-based meal to be offered in the middle of the day. I find if it's offered at the end of the day, it can make baby gassy and it's more difficult to digest and it can cause issues. There's my two cents. That always really, really worked for me. 
napping. Napping is so important. It supports the growth and development and balance is it in it is key. If your baby's napping is not balanced, then it is going to have a direct impact in on their overnight because it potentially is going to have them overtired, which I've, I've mentioned there as well. So if your napping is off, then everything could be off. And if the napping is right, then baby is going to be rested and restored. And their over, overall 24 hours is going to look, look much calmer and much more settled. Now, bedtime routine. Now, lads, I am not into anything that is too complicated with bedtime routine. I prefer to refer to bedtime routine as touch points. So I like to start your bedtime routine as like five to seven o'clock. It's those two hours. And let's say your baby's on solids. They have their tea at five o'clock. They have their bath afterwards. They have their bop bop in a room not associated with sleep and they go to bed. Stepping stones. Now, what I will say to you is in the 20 minutes prior to them going to bed, that's when I would bring them up to the room, change their nappy, dim down the lights, make it all kind of nice and show them oh, we're on the road to bedtime. Sit down, have two age appropriate books, maybe read a little story, maybe do a little sing song. Things that they will soon recognize are the cues for bedtime. Consistencies real consistencies and that really is what a bedtime routine is now bath or not to bath lads a bath is not necessarily going to make your baby sleep any better in fact a bath can make a child quite overtired so i'm you know kind of a fan of a bath every couple of nights and um, not necessarily a bath every night screens turn off all screens in the hour prior to bedtime and this is extremely important for toddlers because how many toddlers have you seen where you've turned off the telly before bed and they go I think go wild. So no, turn off the TV. And I would just establish that from the get go so that when you do eventually have a toddler in your life, that you've no screens before bedtime and establishing reading. I'm a huge fan of reading myself. I love to read and I've definitely established reading with my own family. I think it's a great way to like get into bed and wind down the body before you go to sleep. Now, the next point is the one that always instills the most fear in parents. Whenever you mention self-soothing, everybody thinks, oh my God, my baby is going to cry. Not necessarily. But what I am going to talk about is frustration. So let's say you have been for four months rocking and rolling and patting and feeding your baby to sleep. And you decide, this is not for me anymore. I want to move away from this and I want to create more independent sleep. If you stop doing the things that your baby is used to and you put them down in a cot awake, they are going to be frustrated and this will bring out crying, okay? But crying isn't necessarily the thing they have to do to go to sleep. It's the change that maybe needs to happen that will help them gain their skill over sleep. So sleep is very much a, bit, a, a process, a body process that we're all born with the need to do. However, it is and can be very much a learnt behaviour. There are definitely unicorn babies out there that just sleep. But the majority don't. And they need us as parents to guide them towards it. So uh, what I would say is I, I am in, in favour of parents figuring out what sits best with them and choosing that path to help them create more settled sleep for their child and maybe more independent sleep. And there's lots of different ways of doing this. And I would say, do your research, look at the options open to you. And like, for instance, you know, there's lots of very, very great sleep consultants in Ireland and figure out who fits best with you and follow them and stick with them and see about their advice in terms of getting you to where you want to be. So, the other thing that generally comes up with self-soothing is the use of the soother. Now, soothers have their pros and cons. Long term, I'm not a fan of the soother for sleep simply because of soother reflux, doty reflux. If you do not want to have to get up to your baby three, four, five, six times a night to replug the soother, then don't use it for sleep. And that was something that I very much decided from the outset with my own children so once they kind of got to like three or four months there was no more soother for sleep and we worked on them and able to fall asleep themselves 
which isn't an easy thing. It's not easy. But once you get it kind of under your belt, it's great. It's something that I help parents with all the time. And it means then that you don't have soother reflux in your life. But if you want to maintain the soother in your life, you can establish more settled sleep, but you still may have soother reflux as part of your child's night's sleep. Now, I have a key tip around this that you can, let's say your baby is old enough to self-feed, then they're old enough to replug the soother themselves. So rather than replugging it to their mouth, replug it to their hand and allow them to replug it themselves. That's my top tip. And guys, consistency is key. Key, key, key. If you have sleep issues going on, there is no quick fix. There is no like miracle. Like I talk about the seven steps to better sleep. There, you know, it's not like you do these seven things and it's all just going to work out. These are seven things that need to be in place for your child to be maybe sleeping more settled. But they will take a bit of work behind them to maybe get you to where you want to be. So give it time, no quick fixes. You're looking at a two to four week time period where you really consistently work on things. And even after that, it's a lifestyle choice. You're choosing to have, let's say, settled sleep as your family sleep goal. And you really make sleep a priority in your family. That is really, really, really important. And stay in your own lane. So it doesn't matter what Eileen next door is doing with her baby who was born on the same ward on the same day as your Harry. It does not matter. Stay in your own lane. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, now, these are my kind of like sleep tricks and sleep guidelines. You can really apply these to yourself as a parent, as an adult, like so regular wake time, regular daily routine, regular bedtime. Obviously, I've referenced kind of children's times there. Wind down at bedtime, no screen in the hour prior to bedtime. I know all of you will have heard people say this to you as an adult. Screen free bedtime. We renovated our house four years ago, and the builders thought I was mental. There is no points for televisions upstairs in our house, none, and no mobile phones or any type of uh, tablets or iPads allowed upstairs. They're all left downstairs at night, and our sleep is great. And um, exercise there's a blog post on my website, babogue.com, that is all about exercise and incorporating that to help your sleep and understanding how sometimes exercise at different times of the day can hinder your sleep. And also making sure you take in plenty of water. As an adult, I make sure that I drink um, two litres at a minimum a day. I have a nine-year-old um, and an 11-year-old. I would try and make sure that they drink a litre a day. Um, my four-year-old, you know, I try and make sure that he drinks a good big bottle of water a day. I'm not quite the size of this, but a good big bottle, so maybe up to a litre. And limit your sugar intake. You know, sugar is stimulating and it can absolutely um, impact it on sleep and the darkened sleep environment. That is really, really key across the age ranges, like newborn right up to like, if you're 90, darkened sleep environment is very, very important. Um, now, I have time for a little Q&A and I got submitted in some questions, which I'm delighted about. And I'm gonna read them out here and I'm going to answer, give you my thoughts. So, um, my query is about my two and a half year old. He has never slept well since birth and only ever napped for 20 minutes, but was never tired. We are at the stage now where daytime naps are cut down. My son wakes multiple times every night to check where um, am I there. Seems like a bit of separation anxiety. He's a very light sleeper. Do you have any tips to combat this? So I, it sounds from your message that your little man is potentially very parental dependent on you. So if you are lying down with him to get him to go to sleep, whether he's in a cot or like in a bed, then he thinks that you're staying there. He thinks that's what the norm is around his sleep because it is, it's the norm around sleep. So when he comes into a light sleep phase during the night, which you've now learned from the presentation happens every two to four hours, he will wake up fully because the circumstances around him going to sleep were not the same. So what I would say to you is work on fading yourself out of the room 
every kind of three days, getting closer and closer to the door so that you can allow your little guy to get just a little bit more independent sleep under his belt. And that might help those sleep cycles at night knit up because he's getting to kind of soothe without your presence there, you know, all the time. It sounds like you've been struggling with sleep for quite a while, but that doesn't mean to say that by following that kind of a program, you couldn't um, get it on a little bit further. Now, the next one, um, I'm a mother of two, a three-year-old and a five-year-old. Can you give me some advice on how to put my five-month-old to bed without my three-year-old disturbing them? They have separate rooms, but every time we try it, three-year-old wakes baby or vice versa. Now, this may have to be a bit of divide and conquer. So like mommy takes baby, you know, other half takes the older child. So divide and conquer. Also, I find with three-year-olds, they love a bit of independence and they love a kind of understanding a little bit of rules. So I like to put in place a thing with my clients where we put in um, visual bedtime rules. So like it could be like a sign with lips and a line through it to indicate no talking or no shouting. You know, it could be, you know, that they stay in their bed all night. It's simple things like around kind of the problems that maybe are going on within your household. Um, I also might do that you would get baby to bed first and then you would get toddler to bed and maybe you would incorporate toddler into the getting baby ready for bed and when baby is going to bed the toddler goes to their room to play independently a little bit or goes to their room to maybe pick out their books or something like that for bedtime because I'm sure their bedtimes are quite close together but I find bedtime rules is a good one and putting in place um, some kind of reward. Now, I find that kids nowadays are not into star charts. They like instant gratification, you know, kind of don't we all? But, you know, kind of like, okay, you, you follow the rules, then you will get X in the morning. Like, you know, look, at I'm, I paid the weaning people and, and everything won't like me for this nutritionist, but like a, a button, you know, or a jelly if, if you give those kind of things. Or like a dinky car, you know, you might have a bit box of dinky cars. And like you put them into a bag and make that the magic bag that the dinky cars come out of as, as a surprise for the three-year-old. Okay, next one. My daughter is nine and has not been able to sleep herself for the past two and a half years. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. She either sleeps in bed with us or I have to sleep with her. Nothing major has happened. I was just going to say that. Um, to stop her from sleeping on, she gets very anxious and cannot sleep follow it, uh, sleep unless one of us lays beside her. We thought at the start it was a phase, but it has turned into years. Should we be worried? Oh, listen, love, I don't think you should be worried. I would say a phase has now turned into a norm. And this is her norm around sleep. So I would maybe have a chat with her around, you know, becoming a little bit more independent with sleep and that you're going to help her with that. Um, so I, I have an anxious child and I would use uh, essential oils. Not that they necessarily will fix a sleep issue, but in the use of them for my daughter is settling that they help her settle. So just turning on her diffuser at night and the whole bedtime routine that we put in place and it there settles her. It helps her if she's had a bad day. So something like that as kind of like a swap. Now, don't expect your child to go from sleeping with you to not sleeping with you. Like with the toddler I described um, just slightly before, you may have to fade yourself out of the room over a period of time slowly to help your child get into a little bit more of independent sleep. And again, bedtime rules is something that your little one might understand, but you may have to frame them in a way that doesn't heighten that anxiety. Um, my Oh, my health nurse passed this on to me. Okay, um, I'm having troubles uh, with my baby sleeping. She's 10 months old and um, the youngest of five kids. Oh my goodness. She will sleep once I get her to sleep, but this has become a battle. I would really see this a lot around this age range. I'm so consistent with routine and have tried cutting naps, giving extra naps, feed her more, etc. I don't think it's a comfort thing as she won't sleep with me in, um, in her cot in a buggy. It's a busy house and I understand quick time and the other kids are older and understand, but it could take me one and a half hours each time to get her to sleep for a sake of 40 minute nap. Okay, she, her form is good and she's happy baby. 
but I don't want the chats from midnight to 4am. I don't think any of us, us do, lovey, so don't feel one bit guilty about that. I hope that from maybe what I've gone through today, you might see that it could be something in the timings. Now, this is my routine for a 10-month-old. First nap, if the baby is awake at, let's say, 7 o'clock-ish or slightly before, first nap is at half past nine and no earlier. Then you would let baby sleep for about an hour and a half if you can get it. And um, then the second nap would take place three hours from the end of the first nap. And bedtime would be four to four and a half hours after the end of that nap. Now, if your baby is not independently settling themselves to sleep, so not self-soothing, then that could be the crux of the issue. So if you can work on that piece and fading out maybe the dependency that might be there, then baby goes away on their sleep cycle themselves, knits up the cycle, and things are a little bit more settled. I would say maybe look through the seven steps to better sleep and formulate a little strategy and a plan around that to help you get to maybe where you want to be around her sleep. So that's it. Thank you so much uh, for watching. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about me, you can find out everything you need to know on babo.com. Again, I want to thank uh, Wexford County Library and we Wexford County Council for this opportunity to present uh, to you guys today. Thanks again. Take care and please mind yourself. Stay safe and stay well.